back at it. Your boy's here. A little better quality. Hopefully it pays off. Let's go. Games you absolutely should not buy at retail this month. The month of October. Games that are coming out. Games that are going to be on the hotness. Games that are going to get the clicks. Why you should not buy these games at retail. 10-ish. Talking you off the ledge. Now again, not saying you can't buy them, but maybe reconsider for reasons listed. And if you're still sold on it, then, well, go buy it. But you know what? It's okay. Don't FOMO. It'll still be there six months from now. Go trade for it when it becomes widely available. Wait for all the reviews to come out, you know? It's okay. That being said, what games? What do you need to know? Let's go. Let's start off with the biggest of them all. Let's just go big or go home, right? Mother freaking Frosthaven. Coming to retail. Should you buy it? No, it's like almost $200. Like one of, if not the most expensive retail game that you can buy from mass market, right? This is the mother of all games. This is the mother of all campaign games. This is the mother of all way too much setup and tear down games. You know, on the recent hotness, you're seeing that with Voidfall as the biggest criticism from that game from Mind Clash, right? But Frosthaven, Frosthaven's the equivalent to The Simpsons did it first, right? That meme. Frosthaven did it first! Because it basically set the standard for that. This is a game where people basically make the argument of, you need an insert. Any game that needs an insert to be played, folks, that is a huge... Warning sign, huge red flag. Okay, maybe not red flag, we'll go yellow-ish. Yellow card, maybe not a full red card. I mean, do you have, I don't, yet here I see my copy of Frosthaven sitting behind the camera. Do you have 100 hours to play this game? 100 hours, 100 hours, 100 hours. How many hours do you game a week? Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, start doing the math in your head there and you're gonna go, okay, well, Chris, you know, if I play this game for 100 hours, that's a, you know, $1.50 an hour. That's a great deal compared to a movie, compared to a restaurant, return value. You're not going to play it for 100 hours, though. I know you because you are me. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You know, that's half the reason I got this channel, to force myself to play stuff. And even then, it's difficult. You don't need this. Go buy Gloomhaven 2nd Edition when it comes out. No, skip that. Skip that. You should, at the bare minimum know that you absolutely love this game go get jaws of the lion go get jaws of the lion if you can play all the way through jaws of the lion love it and demand more then maybe you consider this maybe maybe even then maybe so that's number one i mean clear and far away right second we're just swinging for the fences here we're just swinging for the fences expeditions here Go big or go home, right? Stonemeyer Games. I somehow have two copies. I traded for one, and someone randomly sent me another copy. Wasn't Stonemeyer. Don't 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 worry. It actually wasn't Stonemeyer. I have both editions. This is this is a pretty good game. Spoilers there, my review. Pretty good. At the same time, folks, it's probably my favorite Stonemeyer game to this point but it is a little bit longer than it should be. The setup isn't quite as variable as you're gonna like. The rules are typical Stonemeyer, where it's a little bit not presented in the way that would make the most sense in the first place. The card deck is a random smorgasbord of all of the complaints that go into Earth and Ark Nova in the first place, right? randomization you're gonna get things that you've never seen you don't know how to combo and they're gonna be things that are gonna be way overpowered and you know who gets what especially at the higher player count there's a little bit of a meta with the balance side of things not that you're again gonna play this game 20 or 30 times to know what that meta is and it's a little bit more expensive I don't think the size of this game this is an absolute utter table hog everything is about 25% bigger than it needed to be. It is. Nothing against that. It's beautiful to look at. I like some of the mechanisms of the card play 
and the move your essential worker spots around because you have three action spots that you're moving through. And if you reset, then the next turn you get to take all three. But when you take all three, you have to put it, your little cube on a spot. And then in the future, as you move that cube around, the two that it doesn't cover are the two of the three actions you get to take on a turn by turn basis. So you can't do the same two actions every single turn. And again, it's not going to be everyone's ilk. It's not, and that's okay. It's going to be chaotic at four. It's going to be probably longer, and this is probably the other biggest criticism. It's going to stay a little bit too long on its table. If this was a sub hour and a half game, but most of the games turn out to be more around two hours, especially at the three and four player count, or even maybe a touch more, depending on how experienced you are with it. And it's not a bad thing. It's not a horrible game length, right? But for as light as some of the mechanisms are, and that's what the comparison is going to be made. I'm, I'm speaking for, facetiously for other people, right? The lighter mechanisms, longer game frame, right? If I want lighter mechanisms, I also want a shorter time frame. So that's the other issue. And it's expensive for what it is. And you're paying for that extra 25 to 30% of the size markup. It is. It is. It's completely that. So there you go. Sagrada Artisans. Sagrada Artisans is finally at retail. If you knew me, I critiqued the heck out of this thing when it went to crowdfunding. I said, pick it up at retail. You know what? Go pick it up at retail. At the same time, do you want Sagrada campaign? Do you want Sagrada scenario-based situationals with asymmetric abilities? Were you a fan of Sagrada rolling dice and manipulating them in your first play of the game? Are you... Team role player or are you team Sagrada? It seems to be very divisive on which people prefer which one. I personally have always actually been team role player, mostly, even though I got rid of role player because it kind of got a little samey with the base game and it got, it got a little bit too convoluted and complex with all of the expansion stuff, which gave it more legs, but also gave it more legs, right? Am I right? So Sagrada Artisans, you know, I said pass on the crowdfunding side of things, right? I don't want a pencil sharpener. I don't want colored pencils. I'm not paying extra money on crowdfunding for that. What the deuce? And it's an expensive Sagrada. It is. You can buy a couple of the base game expansion content for the price of this one now. So is it offering that much new? Or is it more like Clank, where you find your flavor and you just stick with it because you know they're going to put out one or two other flavors? And so maybe you're also better off waiting for the next flavor that comes around because just like with Clank, you know it's going to happen. I don't think Clank Catacombs is going to be the last one. Heck, we saw Clank Legacy. We saw, heck, we saw Clank, um, heck, we saw Clank Penny and Card. Heck, we saw Penny Arcade Acquisitions Incorporated 2 after Clank Catacombs. So if you don't think they have more in store from this IP, you know, a la zombie side, well... Have I got some bad news for you? But you can still consider it if you really want to get your taste and dabble in things. Interestingly enough, the next one we're actually going to be talking about on this list is even more so a legacy game that is dividing the crowds significantly. And that is Ticket to Ride Legacy. Reviews are out there. Price is up there. So, uh, again... With this, as well as the next game, the main point with these legacy games is, right, you're going to get a group of people, a group of people, three, potentially, ideally, four, to play multiple games of Ticket to Ride. And some of you are going to go, I'm past my gaming evolution of what Ticket to Ride offers from a mechanic standpoint, Chris. And I go, awesome. Now, this is going to be offering a little bit extra. They're trying not to spoil it. But if you're like me and you watch the three-minute board game review of it. Thank you, Jared. Thank you for doing that. Mixed feelings. Mixed feelings on it. It is not getting the raving acclaim that I think a lot of us were really hoping for as looking back at one of the games that got us into the hobby and giving it fresh life. Sort of like the original Risk Legacy did, right? That pulled people back to that because of how good it was. There's no scoring track. Victory points decided by cash and routes completed. Um... I mean, early reviews on Board Game Geek are mostly positive, but you're talking like 60 to 80 reviews right now. And I think it's one of those where you really have to love what they're putting out with a Ticket to Ride, right? This isn't going to be, like I said, the win you back style if you weren't a fan of it. 
you know, personally, I'm an on the underground fan. Like, love that game. Fan freaking tastic. One of the most underrated games in my collection. But I've played that and I've played this. And I'm looking mechanically speaking and I'm going, okay, I don't know if I really want this. And again, this, just like Expeditions, this is even more of a premium price. And for that much of a premium price, like, and we're not even talking pandemic legacy prices. We're talking, you know, an extra 33% beyond the pandemic legacy prices. And that's a hefty price to pay a 12 campaign style game. Again, as I just mentioned in the other, Frosthaven, etc. If you can't play a game half a dozen times, how are you going to play a game a dozen times with the same anywhere from, well, we'll say two, because that's actually what the player count says, two to five. No, you're going to play at least with three or four. This is a three or four player game, period. I think four and five is going to also outstay its welcome. It's going to get a little lengthy. It's going to get a little long in the tooth. But can you get past nostalgia for Ticket to Ride? That's what you have to ask yourself right now. Similarly, similarly here, now stay with me, My Island, the sequel standalone to My City from Cosmos. Again, these games say as one of their main taglines, right? Like Pandemic Legacy, Ticket to Ride Legacy, uh, My City. Hey, you get a completely unique game at the end of it so you can play it again and again. I have literally seen like zero people in the time since like the original Pandemic Legacy came out that are like, oh yeah, I still have our Pandemic Legacy board. That's our preferred Pandemic. We played that Pandemic board all the time now. Or over the other ones said no one ever, right? And if that's one of your main selling points as why it's worth it, uh, Charterstone don't need recharge packs either. Recharge packs, nope, no thank you. No thank you, no thank you. Not worth it. That's an additional cost on top of the everything else, time-wise, money-wise cost that goes into the original then as well. I mean, this is hexagon-based. This has 24 games. 24 games in the collection, right? Two to four players. Now, interestingly enough, each of these games is gonna be completely different, right? It's gonna go scale-wise the opposite of Ticket to Ride. It's gonna be 30 minutes and the recommended, and you know, take this very, very loosely off of Board Game Geek, the recommended player counts actually two. Probably because you can whip through those games even faster than 30 minutes. So all of a sudden 24 becomes a lot more palatable, but still, still 24, 24. Common theme here, right? Can you actually play it enough with any of these to make them worthwhile? And for most of us, the answer is no, folks. How many times have I seen my city go up on like secondary market or the board game geek math trades, right? Like tons. And you know what the commonality is between almost all of those games? Although it kind of has to be that way if you're gonna try and get rid of it in the first place. Still in shrink. Still in shrink. Which means someone bought it and said, I don't have the group to play it with, right? Almost every time. Occasionally you see the few and far between. If we played a game and it, you know, kind of stopped there and you can take it and it's gonna be, you know, 15 bucks because we already started it. But most of the time it's new and shrink. So how do you feel about that now? Let's just stay with this this month. We have a relatively good thing going. So let's stay on track here with Descent. FFG was like, hey, you guys want a new edition of Descent? Everyone was like, yes. And they were like, well, we're going to give you kind of a different thing altogether. And then they did that with Legends of the Dark. And now there's a new expansion. Did you play through Legends of the Dark? Did you want that deluxified Descent version in the first place? You want to go back to Terranoth with uh, the Betrayer's War? Is it going to actually add some new stuff? Some people really liked it. Some people, not as much, especially with the terrain and the models and the setup and the teardown. Although it was a little bit easier based, how do you feel? It's purely app-driven, folks. It's purely app-driven. Anyone that was looking at it from that aspect, they're immediately like, nope, delete, uh, not interested anymore. Then they say, well, there's a longer quest, there's more hero upgrades, there's a dragon. And you can paint it, right? Like, nope, nope, you know me. Gameplay. Gameplay, folks. That's what wins it over. Did I mention? <laughs> this is the other thing, right? This is not a standalone expansion, right? Buried the lead there. So you need the original. You need then to buy the expansion. So let's say you get it on the secondary market, the base game for 80 or $90. I see it going in that range most of the time on the secondary market. Guess what the cost of this new expansion is, right? Because it's bigger. It's bigger. 
most online places are selling it for between 125 and 130 dollars you're talking 200 dollars investment right here people are complaining about that all the time on crowdfunding well don't worry it's equally unavailable from a price standpoint now in retail you know frost haven descent legends of the dark we're just ramping the price up price creep is real folks you thought it was just on crowdfunding no it's forking at retail too be aware is it that much better go play jaws of the lion i guess right i don't know is it doing something that much different in a gm list upgraded version of descent with better storyline i mean it's guiding good reviews ish 60 reviews on board game geek 24 comments that's a huge barrier to entry it is you have to love Descent. You have to love this system. And, it, you know, apparently it's going to offer a whole lot more for, I don't know, 25 to 30% more of the price as well. I'd hope so. But I guess the good thing is you can get free shipping on it alone from some of those stores because of the price? Question mark? Small silver lining? There you go. Is it that much better than other things? Is it better than Madara? Is it better than Gloomhaven? Is it better than Chronicles of Drunagor? What is your flavor? If you don't know your flavor, this isn't the one you go into, folks. It isn't. Go look elsewhere. Try it before you buy it, just in case. Let's let's get away from this for a second here, though. Let's go over to the S and Hotness. The other one that I've had my eye on, White Castle, Devere's latest. I'm looking at this going, hmm, hmm, Euro-style game. Building a Japanese city stronghold. I like the idea of this. One of the clans, victory points, amassing in the court resource management, Little bit of dice worker placement. You know me, dice worker placement's my forte. Devere, Bitoku, Jerusalem. Good track record. But S and Hotness release, right? I, I browse things on the geek lists, on the Reddits, on the Facebookses. And you know what I see around this time of year? People doing kind of what I've done as well in the past. Looking back at the previous hotnesses from the conventions and saying, ha, 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 how many of those are actually still in your collection? Yeah. How many? How many? Last year, hotness. You got them? They still there? You got them? You still playing them? You got them? You still playing them over other stuff? Hmm. It's a little harder, right? Like the Reddit posts are like, I have 12 out of my 80 from the past two years of Essence still even in my collection and we only play six of them. That's essentially what you've got going on here. Again, not saying it's not going to be the exception, but you do the math there for a second, right? 12, 6 out of 80, right? Whatever you want to value it. That's not a good percentage. That's not a good percentage. The percentage of high value games acquired from hotness post convention, anecdotally speaking, is incredibly low. I see it across the board. In the sampling size, yeah, it's not great. This is all completely anecdotal. But tell me I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong in the comment section. That people are like, I have bought so many games that stay in my collection from conventions, said hardly anyone ever. Like, you see all the halls, and those are the same halls that end up getting sold. Those are the same people that end up having these massive collections of either like 1,200 games or selling, you know, 400 at a time. And a lot of those are hotness. If you check out the Board Game Geek auctions, the Board Game Geek marketplace, the trade lists on that side of things, a lot of them immediately go there. Sometimes new and shrink, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes, well, they've been played once and they were kind of like, oh, I guess I didn't like it. Well, that's the problem with retail in general, folks. Less rule book, less reviews, less content when you're getting it hyped up to you. Say what you will and degrade Kickstarter all you want, but at least there's a more of that on a pound for pound basis when you're pre-ordering it, right? Let's stay Euro-wise. Let's go reap on something else. Revive is finally coming over to North America. Revive, another heavier Euro uh, play with the same group of people, four player best style game. Again, like 70, 80 bucks. Hey, don't worry though. There's already an expansion out that can make it even better. How do you feel about that? This is some of the people's game of the year, but again, you have to remember the skewing on Board Game Geek if that's your main source of information, right? It skews, especially heavily wise, more people who are going to like the game are going to have the game and play the game. You don't see that with lighter games because lighter games get everybody under the sun and gives you more of a smorgasbord arrangement of opinions. 
The heavier games are primarily picked up by heavier game fans, not light game fans, and so you're collectively going to have a little bit more selection bias in the people that are putting the information out in the first place. I don't say that as a bad thing. I'm biased too. But is it going to be, just like the next one on the list, Darwin's Forkin' Journey, is it really that much better than the other Euros or heavier worker placement style games? Darwin's Journey, I'll make the argument, is suffering the same thing as Revive right now. The unavailability when it actually became hot. It became hot and nobody could get it. And a bunch of other Euros, worker placement games, heavy style of things, came out at retail between when it crowdfunded and when it arrived to people. Just like the reviews from Revive. The first wave advanced copies for all of the huge channels came out, it got some hype, and guess where the other copies were, for the most part, North America-wise speaking. I know, I'm biased North America-wise. That's where I live. Nowhere. So now that, I mean, I don't know, we're talking almost a year later. Can it get traction? Not that, again, it's a bad game. It sort of reminds me of the other one that I have a review of pending at this time that just had to, you know, go through crowdfunding and, and you're going to try and come again now. Monasterium, same thing. Kind of got some hype. Kind of didn't get a wide English North America release at all. They're trying to get it back on its feet. And the problem is you get crowded out. Not crowdfunding wise, but just sheer numbers wise with the games that come to retail. And so you need attraction there because people then go, hey, all of these other ones have come out since. All of these other ones have even more availability and, you know, critiques, reviews, comments, thoughts on them. Why would I go with one even though it was hyped six months ago, eight months ago, ten months ago? And there's still not as much information. Why don't I go with one that's got more in the first place? And yeah, both of these are trickling out more right now. But none, say, the amount of, uh, say, Carnegie, which funded and delivered between completely when Darwin's funded and delivered. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying either of these are bad. I'm not saying either of these might not be one of your favorite games of the year. They've both got nearly 4,000 ratings on Board Game Geek with over an eight point rating as well. So people like it, but again, how much selection bias as well. Do you want this style? These are the heaviest games potentially on this list. Are you a heavy gamer? I had a copy of Carnegie, guess where it went? Gone too heavy for me. What I thought I might want is not in practice with what I can actually get played. Can you take advantage of these? That's the other similarity. People have these, have a lot of these, just like other things. And are these going to be better than your other favorite heavies in the first place? Let's spin things all together. We've been talking heavy too much. Let's go super light. Super light at the other end of the, the critique, Point City, AEG flat out, it's coming to retail. Um, I did my short review on it uh, the other week. Uh, talking you through it. Uh, it's a very nice, very random set collection style of engine build game. I really like the double-sided cards where one side is a resource, one side is the building, and uh, depending on which one you pull from the center grid marketplace, essentially, if you will, uh, you replace it with a card on the opposite side. So if you pull a, a resource card out of there, you put it down one that has the building face up and vice versa, and it's kind of cool but there's not a whole lot of correlation to what's on one side and what's necessarily on the other side when you get uh, up through the levels of cards because there's like the beginner one level cards, the two level cards, and then the three level cards. And you go until, you know, you really kind of run out of cards in the deck. And it's got a clever system of you have to grab two cards next to each other. So it might be a resource and a building. It might be two buildings. It might be two resources, whatever combination you want. You can take them in either order, but there's a lot of randomness. It's cute, plays nicely, plays relatively quickly but you're not gonna have the control of the engine building if you want it in the first place. And you know what? The Kickstarter little extra scoring things that you may have missed as the extra content there, don't worry, you won't miss them. So, you know, you'd be okay at retail with this one, but it's gonna be really random in that sense with those decks of cards and the grid. Little control, little no control. How do you feel? Second light game here. Love this game actually when I crowdfund previewed it. I don't actually preview it though, because I actually gave an opinion on it and I didn't get paid for Northwood. This is a great, fantastic trick-taking game. Never seen anything like it. Really awesome game. Doing some unique, unique trick-taking things. I buried the lead here, though. Did you see that? It's a one-player game. <laughs> 
That's why I don't have a copy right now. It's a one player game. I think it's fantastic. But it's also not going to change your mind if you aren't a fan of one player games in the first place. It's not. If you're not a fan of trick taking in the first place, it's way too random. Difficulty is no, it's not regicide difficulty, but it's up there. Because sometimes you're just flipping cards over from the deck trying to determine whether or not they, you know, AI, if you will, the enemy beats you or not. And it's going to be way too random in that way for a lot of people too from a trick taking side of things. And blessing curse of one player from that side, right? You're not going to have that control. It's not a scripted AI system. There's the randomness in there. It's going to drive you crazy. So you're going to pass on it for that reason as well. The second game from the acclaimed Darrington Press. A la the adjacent Critical Role tabletop board gaming company. This is second, Queen by Midnight, from their previous Okotoa. The concept sounds really cool, right? Deck building? Competitive? Trying to be the queen by the time the clock strokes 12? Doing something unique with the time-based system and how you're drafting the cards differently? Rulebook is apparently not good. Errata, right out the gate. Playtesting? Balancing? Those are some big concerns. Not a ton of wide availability or height from that side of things either. Doing something unique is good. But if you're going to do something unique, you got to do it freaking awesome. When you scroll through the Board Game Geek comment section, and the comments across the board are, Rulebook is missing basic information. Many cards don't make sense. Mechanic of player elimination along with that as well as an allegiance system that kind of leaves people confuddled Well, that's not necessarily the most encouraging. They say it's fun especially at different player counts anywhere from three to six It's a lot of variability and I say that as someone who loves deck building right people house ruling it You know asymmetric princesses abilities that go along with it. I mean the potential is there but this is a game of how much are you willing to house rule or deal with potential? Where I'm looking at a couple games in my collection, like Warehouse 13, where the rule book just lets you down. You know that there's a core concept in there somehow that the rule book is covering up and preventing you from fully exploring and deciding how good it could actually be in the first place. And that's what this has written all over it in that sense. And I was really looking forward to this one. Darrington Press, I was like, okay, you know what? Okay, give me some good pedigree here. Put out a really good freaking game. Show me what you can do. But I mean, it speaks of just some QI issues. And wanted to get it from a new, unique deck building aspect. Boom! Mechanistic dagger to the heart for me, right? But with comments like that, I can't pay 40, 50, 60, whatever it's going to be, dollars. Too many great games. Don't need a, well, it could be a hit or miss game. So, we'll see. We'll see what else Darrington's going to put out. I'm all for it. Show me what you got. Prove me wrong. I'm always okay with that. That's all I got. Retail list. Don't buy any of these games. Or do if you don't mind any of my criticisms whatsoever. Because I'm sure I completely sold you on a couple of these. Or sold you off of them. I don't know. Hopefully the video quality's a little bit better. I'm working on that in the background. Let me know. That's all I got. See, classy. Have a great freaking fantastic day. Maybe I can get my video quality actually halfway decent. You know, people will actually subscribe. I wonder how many people have viewed my videos and been like, ah, this video's crap. The guy's, the guy's doing okay, but the video's crap, right? Like, and somehow I'm still at this point. So if I could actually get that, maybe, maybe I'd get some traction further. I don't know. I'm just making this stuff up as we go anyway. That's what's so fun about my channel. It's all just off the cuff making up as we go. That's why I love talking about things. Peace out. See you around.